If you're struggling to focus, if your kids are struggling to focus, it's not your fault. It's not their fault. Your attention has been stolen by some really big and powerful forces. Dr. James Williams, who had been a Google strategist, spoke at a tech conference, speaking to a lot of the people who are designing the world that you, me, and our kids live in. And he said to them, is there anybody here who wants to live in the world that we're creating? Put up your hand. And not one person put up their hand. If you want to understand one of the ways in which social media invades your attention, I think it might help to think about a long dead scientist and philosopher who inspired key parts of how social media currently works. His name is B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner discovered you can take a living creature that seems to be making its own decisions, seems to be choosing what to do. And if you just choose to reward one particular behavior, you can make the animal, for a while at least, obsessed with that behavior. So you could try them at home if you're feeling a little bit sadistic. Take a pigeon and put it in a cage that's got one of those things that dispenses seed into the cage. And choose in advance something the pigeon does, like say, raising its left wing, and wait for it to do it. Once the pigeon does that, release a little bit of seed into the cage. If you do that enough times, the pigeon will learn, oh, if I want to get some seed, I'll raise my left arm. And it will start obsessively raising its left arm or whatever you chose to reward. That's how they train dolphins to do flips and things at sea life. The people who invented Instagram and loads of the social media apps that we now use drew on BF Skinner. Their goal was to get you to use their app as long as possible and to pick it up as frequently as you possibly can. The more you use it, the more money they make. So they figured if we give people an arbitrary series of rewards, we can train you to do the same thing over and over and over again. And that is why they introduced likes and hearts and retweets. These are methods designed to train you, just like that pigeon in that cage was trained, to crave an arbitrary reward and to keep doing that thing again and again to get that rush of affirmation. When I see people sort of obsessively taking selfies and posting them on Instagram, you're just one of BF Skinner's pigeons with a six pack. Don't waste your life on bullshit. Don't waste your life playing a stupid game in order to win a stupid prize. When you're on your deathbed, hopefully when you're very old, you will not lie there thinking about all the likes you got on Instagram. You'll think about moments of meaning and connection with other human beings. I want people to feel freer than ever before and to feel more worthy, having, having achieved more than they've ever done before. But beyond that, beyond the, the accomplishments of the individual, we must take into account where the culture as a whole is going. I went to interview a man named Professor Suna Lehman, who's done some of the most important research that shows that our collective attention span really does seem to be shrinking. And he said to me, the day I went to see him, he'd just seen a photograph that had come out then. And it was a photograph of Mark Zuckerberg in a room. And everyone in that room is wearing a virtual reality headset, and Mark Zuckerberg is the only person who's not wearing it. And Professor Lehman said to me, shit, that's a potential vision of our future. A world where we are increasingly manipulated and you've got a sort of elite who insulate themselves who have endless meditation workshops don't let their kids use this technology go off into their own little silo where they're protected and we are increasingly hacked and invaded and it made me think I think we are in a race right now on the one side you've got all these forces invading our attention and they are only if we don't act going to become more powerful Paul Graham one of the most influential investors in Silicon Valley said the world is set to become more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last 40 think about how much more addictive TikTok is for a child than Facebook but they are only going to get more invasive as time goes by. Facebook has already patented a technology that could read your emotions through the camera on your phone and on your laptop and adjust the algorithms accordingly. There's a technology that I learned about from the brilliant technologist Aza Raskin called Style Transfer. You can train an algorithm to look at a painting by say, I don't know, Monet and it learns Monet's style and then you can plug a photo into it and it will remake it in the style of Monet. Style Transfer could easily be applied to say your emails. It could scan through all your emails and it could learn what are the forms of words that you personally respond to best. And then it could sell that information to advertisers. You would never know. You just suddenly start to get emails that seemed much more persuasive to you personally. You're gonna get a call, but it's gonna be coming from actually a call center run by AI that has read your social media, knows your language, uses it back against you in the voice of one of your parents with a face of some of your friends. This is where it's going. We need to be thinking no longer just about human-centered design, but human protective design. 
Now there's all sorts of techniques like that, that if we don't regulate these companies, they're gonna become more and more invasive. In fact, Facebook have said they want us to live in the metaverse wearing virtual reality headsets. There's a particular way that the social media companies want us to frame this debate and don't fall for it. They want this debate to be framed as a pro-tech or anti-tech argument. And of course, if it's pro-tech or anti-tech, 99.9% .9 of people are going to think, well, I'm not going to convert and join the Amish. I'm not going to give up my phone. Oh shit, we'll just have to live with the way we are. It's the question is not, are you pro-tech or anti-tech? We're all pro-tech. The question is, what tech designed for what purposes in whose interest? The issue isn't the existence of the smartphone. That would, of course, have brought some challenges. The primary issue is that currently, the apps we use on that smartphone are specifically designed to maximize the harvesting of our attention because that's the business model they depend on. But we can have all our smartphones and we can have all those apps based on different business models and the invasion of our attention will be radically less. So we want tech. We want tech that heals our attention, not tech that hacks and invades our attention. And that is entirely technologically feasible. That is entirely politically feasible. We just need to fight for it and have a collective movement to get us through the valley to that tech. It doesn't matter whether the people who run these social media companies are lovely or horrible, it's irrelevant. At the moment, there is a systematic misalignment, as Tristan Harris and others have said, between your interests and their interests. Their interests are to hack your attention as much as possible, to sell your attention to advertisers. And your interests, if you're a sane person, are to be able to focus and pay attention. There is a fundamental gap between their interests and your interests at the moment. And until we change the business model, that gap will absolutely remain. The only way to close that gap is to change their incentives by changing the business model. Beyond freedom and dignity lies the future. And that is what we must take into account. We must make sure that human behavior will be so designed that it will maximize our chances of solving our problems and giving a decent world to the people who follow us. As George Monbiot said, look at a photograph of a beach in Britain or America, anywhere in the Western world in, let's say, 1970. Everyone is what we would call either slim or buff. Everyone. There's no fat people. What happened, right? Where were the fat people? Obesity levels were incredibly low by our standards in 1970. And what happened? There was a big change in the way we live. Our food supply changed from mostly consisting of nutritious and fresh food that we cooked and prepared ourselves to overwhelmingly processed food that we get from supermarkets that's pumped full of stabilizers and all sorts of factors that strip it of nutritional value. These changes produced an obesity crisis. We didn't become weak, we didn't become greedy, all the stigmatizing things people say about people who are overweight. What happened is the society changed and that produced a social epidemic of obesity. All sorts of changes are happening that profoundly harm our attention. We sleep much less. We're exposed to a diet that profoundly damages our attention and focus. Now, there are lots of personal changes we can make. I've made a lot. I'm strongly in favor of personal changes. I go through a lot of them. But we've got a level with people that's not gonna solve the problem for most people. Because at the moment, it's like someone is constantly pouring itching powder over our minds, and then they're leaning forward and going, do you know what, mate? Uh, you might want to learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much. Well, I'm strongly in favor of meditation, but we've also got to take on the forces that are doing this to us. This is a systemic crisis, and systemic crises require systemic solutions that get to the heart of why they're happening. These factors aren't just wrecking your ability to pay attention and my ability to pay attention. They're really damaging our society's ability to pay attention. Think about something that happened when I was a kid, the ozone layer crisis. Every October, a hole appears in the ozone layer over the South Pole. The hole in the ozone shield is the size of the continental United States. The protective ozone layer is being threatened as never before. We're all at risk. So the planet is protected by an ozone layer that surrounds us and protects us from the sun's rays. And it was discovered that there was something called CFCs, a chemical that was contained in various products we use, like hairsprays, and we loved hairsprays in the 80s, that was destroying the ozone layer. It was creating a hole in the ozone layer above the Arctic that risked melting the Arctic. So, what happened? The science was explained to ordinary people. Those ordinary people understood the science and distinguished it from lies, conspiracy theories, false stories. Those ordinary people pressured their governments to act, to ban CFCs. They even pressured governments that were not very ideologically sympathetic to government regulation. Margaret Thatcher, George Bush Sr. And what happened? We came together, we banned CFCs, they're no longer used anywhere, and the ozone layer is healing. 
I think it's hard to believe that would happen now. I think you would get one group of people who would start wearing ozone layer stickers, they'd start saying the right things. You'd have another group of people who'd say, well, how do we even know the ozone layer exists? Maybe the hole in the ozone layer was made by George Soros. You get people spraying hairsprays at the sky going, fuck you liberals, here's your hole in the ozone layer. We would tribalize, we would not be able to distinguish truth from lies, and we wouldn't solve the problem. Compare that to what's happening now. It's not just that our individual ability to pay attention has been destroyed, our collective ability to pay attention has been destroyed. We are losing our greatest superpower, our ability to pay attention, at the time of our greatest challenge. Our species is facing an unprecedented series of tripwires and trapdoors. There has been nothing in our history like the climate crisis. A species of people mainly interacting through TikTok and Twitter and alternating that with YouTube and porn is not going to be a species that can solve the climate crisis. To solve the climate crisis, we have to be able to restore attention and restore sanity because it's going to require a lot of collective and sustained attention. It's going to require us to distinguish truth from nonsense and conspiracy theory. And this is urgent because we know that with each year that passes and we pump more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we don't make the transition we've got to make, it gets harder and harder to find our way back. And the same is true of attention. As our attention degrades and degrades, it can get to the point where we're so degraded, we can't summon the individual and collective attention to get back to where we need to be. So these crises are intimately interconnected. How are we going to solve the climate crisis if our individual and collective attention has been destroyed? We can't. To save the ecosystem, we've got to save our own minds. We've got to get our attention back. Solution here is very obvious. You've got to ban this current business model. Just ban it. Get rid of it. We don't need it. Just say that a business model based on tracking people in order to discover weaknesses in their attention and then selling their attention to the highest bidder we do not allow that as a society. And I remember saying to Aza and lots of the other people who in Silicon Valley who told me this was the answer, what happens the day after the ban when I open Facebook and Twitter? Does it just say, sorry, mate, we've gone fishing? And they said, of course not. What would happen is they would have to move to a different business model. And there's lots of different business models that everyone watching has had some experience of. I'll just name two. One is very simple, it's subscription. Very easy to do. You pay 50 cents or whatever it would be a month and you get access to Facebook, just like we do with Netflix. That's one model. Another model is something that everyone has experience of very close to them right now. Wherever you are, unless you're in a very obscure part of the world, you're very close to a sewage pipe. Now, before we had sewage pipes, we had shit in the streets, we had cholera. So together, we all pay for sewers to be built and we maintain the sewage pipes together and we own the sewers together. Now, it might be in the same way that we own the sewage pipes together, we want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the kind of equivalent of cholera for our attention. If there's a subscription model or if there's some kind of public ownership independent of government, suddenly you're not the product anymore. You're the customer. And that means their behavior shifts. At the moment, all that engineering power is geared towards asking, what is your weakness? What are the weaknesses in your attention? How do we hack them and how do we sell them to someone else? We don't even know the full extent of what Facebook and Google store or what they do with it. All we know is that they're collecting our data on an unprecedented scale and making billions off of it. That's their real business model. They're monetizing us. When we use these sites, we're not the customer, we're the product. But it's just as technologically easy and it's just as politically feasible to have a social media that's designed instead to heal your attention. Now, Facebook will never do that of their own accord. Same with all the other social media companies. We have to make them do it. And there's a really good historical analogy for this. Something very similar happened in the past and we put it right. Until the 1970s, it was quite common for people to paint their homes with lead paint and to put leaded petrol into their cars. Actually, it was known from the 1920s that exposure to lead really damages children's brains, their ability to focus, their ability to pay attention. But the entire lead industry funded a kind of fake branch of science to deny the evidence. But by the time you got to the 1970s, that science, it was just undeniable that lead was causing these profound negative effects. And so what happened? There was a movement of ordinary people led in Britain by a housewife called Jill Runette, who just said, we're not gonna let these people do this to our children's brains. No, we don't tolerate it. It's a big movement of ordinary people. And they were not saying, well, let's ban paint. And they were not saying, let's ban petrol. They were saying, let's ban the specific component 
in lead and petrol that is harming our kids' attention. So by 1987, they were banned. Your brain is healthier because Jill Runette and all those other people fought to protect your brain from exposure to lead. Now it's our job to protect the next generation from a business model for social media that is profoundly damaging our ability to focus and pay attention. I think we need an attention movement to reclaim our minds. And it requires a shift in psychology. We are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies. We own our own minds and we can take them back if we want to. Please join Double Down News on Patreon. This is a model of attention, exactly the kind of sane attention we need. These guys can make videos like this because they're not slaves to the algorithm. They're not dependent on advertising. They're dependent on you and me. So please support them. Go now and sign up to Patreon Double Down News.